find it a little bit strange that you're not upset. Well, I'm being accused, which is, anyways, like I said, I reserve the right to remain silent. So. No, no, no. I, okay, that's okay. But I, I just find it strange that you're not upset. But by all what's going on right now. I find it very strange to be in this situation. You so do? I don't know what to think of it. I'm just trying to stay calm. Why do you use the word strange? Right now, like I said, I'm just staying calm and I'm waiting for it to go to court tomorrow and following my lawyer's advice. That's it. But do you believe what I told you? No, I don't believe what you're saying to me, so... Okay, you don't believe me. No. So... What do you believe? Just reserving my right to remain silent. I, I'm just asking you, what do you believe? What I believe. <laughs> Which is? Like I said, I'm do, here do, right now and do you I believe? Go to court do you believe? Anything. Do you believe that your daughters are alive? These were the school lunchboxes of nine-year-old Amanda and eight-year-old Sabrina DeVito. They were packed by their grandmother Teresa in the early morning hours of March 31st, 2009, the last Tuesday before the Easter holidays. Little did Teresa know she would find these lunchboxes nine hours later exactly as she left them, and then go on to discover the lifeless bodies of her two granddaughters in the family playroom. Their mother, 43-year-old Adele Sorella, was nowhere to be seen. She had left a voicemail for her brother Luigi that afternoon, essentially stating that she was suicidal and for him to come to the house immediately. Luigi called his brother and mother right away, all of whom drove to Adele's residence in Laval, Quebec, arriving at roughly 4.30 p.m. to make their tragic discovery. Detective Francois Delisle arrived at the scene roughly 20 minutes after the paramedics, and the two children were already pronounced dead. The Laval police would then launch a murder investigation with the primary objective of finding finding Adele, the prime suspect, and investigators speculated over both the method and motive for the homicides. The conjecture was that the girls had most likely been poisoned, and the reason for their murder being what is known as spousal revenge filicide. The term is used in forensic psychology for when a parent kills one or more of their own children as a means of exacting revenge upon their spouse or partner. Adele's husband at the time was 42-year-old Giuseppe DeVito a well-known member of the Rizzuto crime family in Montreal. He had been on the run from police for over four years at the time, wanted for coordinating a failed drug operation in January of 2005. He attempted to smuggle over 200 kilograms of cocaine into Canada from Haiti, which was essentially his retirement plan. But the RCMP had other plans, as intelligence was gathered about the shipment and the drugs were seized upon arrival. Giuseppe went into hiding at the start of 2005, but the authorities knew he was still in regular contact with his wife, and even met up with her and his daughters on several occasions. But according to reports, all contact from his end abruptly ceased at the very start of 2009, three months before his children were murdered. Adele was located at 3 a.m. on April 1st, roughly 15 hours after the investigation was launched. She had crashed into a utility pole on a rural roadway in eastern Laval. The force of the collision caused serious damage to the driver's side of her car, but Adele sustained no injuries. An accident scene investigator would later testify that the crash was most likely deliberate. The suspect was initially taken to the hospital under police supervision, where she remained for nine hours. She was then handcuffed and taken to the Laval Police Department, where her interrogation commenced at exactly 7 p.m. The segment of footage released by the Crown Attorney's Office starts 40 minutes into the procedure, and what makes this one of the more fascinating interrogations is the detective's approach and how he goes about trying to achieve his objective. What we know is that he initially discussed the car accident with a suspect and double-checked she was without physical injury. They then briefly discuss hospital food and hospitals in general, all essentially small talk for the purpose of rapport development. 
At around minute 25, she was informed that her two children were dead and that she was under arrest for first-degree murder. She was read her rights and given the choice to speak with an attorney, which she accepted, and was then taken to another room where she got legal advice over the phone for roughly 15 minutes. She was then brought back to the interrogation room and was asked if she wanted any water. She refused and then stated she was invoking her right to remain silent. In Canada, the suspect is well within their right not to answer questions, yet this doesn't confine the interrogator from asking questions. They can essentially press for as long as they want, and if the suspect is coaxed out of silence, anything that gets divulged is still admissible in court. I find it a little bit strange that you're not upset. I'm do, here do, right now, and do you believe, to court do, you believe do you believe that your daughters are alive? Yes. So, but, but I'm staying calm. I have the regret to inform you that they're dead. Both of them. No, they're not. So. That's why you're not upset. I told you I'm staying calm. <laughs> Yeah, and but everything will be fine. And not not only that they are deceased, both of them, but you are under arrest for killing them. Look, I'm their mother, so. I know. That's why it's so difficult. The detective has now abandoned the more common strategies of reframing and rapport development. He is no longer trying to be the suspect's friend, nor is he trying to downplay the crimes. He instead initiates a continuous psychological barrage that attacks every aspect of Adele's character, and this persists for almost five hours. Under different circumstances, his behavior would be considered harassment or even abuse, yet the detective executes his strategy in a manner so passive that any assertions of malpractice or intimidation will hold little to to no weight in court. He maintains a very calm disposition, yet manages to superimpose a highly disparaging tone at the same time. He's able to apply a remarkable amount of psychological pressure in the absence of aggression. The simple reason for this strategy is to precipitate fatigue. Mentally exhausted suspects are more susceptible to suggestion and less likely to think rationally. In other words, their ability to consider the long-term consequences of a decision will be significantly limited. Everybody's going to think that you couldn't bear the fact that they would be happy without you. They're going to say that, and that's why you killed them. So what's going to come, there's going to be a lot of disapprobation on what you did. And a lot of misunderstanding, and a lot of anger at you. You're going to have to face that. I'm just warning you in advance. You just have to keep focused on the reason why you did it. This is your strike. You disagree? You do disagree. You're difficult to read, but <laughs> now you disagree with what I'm saying. Why? You can tell me. Don't be afraid. I won't get mad. I know. But there's one thing that we need an explanation on. The use of crime scene photographs is perhaps the most recognized procedure with regard to interrogations. It's a strategy used to gauge a suspect's response, especially if the images being presented are of a gruesome nature, and even more so if the victims are personally connected to the suspect. The sharp and sudden manner in which they are often presented is done so a suspect is caught off guard, and this is thought to make it much harder for them to fabricate emotion in a convincing manner. It's a highly effective technique, and the following segment of footage was presented presented by the prosecution at Adele's trial three times, once during the opening statement and twice during the closing argument. We need to explain this. 
Let me talk to my lawyer. Look at that. This is the truth. These are your daughters. Something brought you to do that to them. How can we explain this? How is it possible that you brought your brother to see this? You send it home, knowing you will find this? Why weren't you there? How can you explain that this could happen? What in your life brought you to that? We have to explain this. Look at that. You gave them life. You brought them up. They trusted you. Do you want to say something? I'm still listening. No, I don't want to say anything. Okay. I don't believe that's them on the floor. Sorry? Did you say that? You don't believe that's them on the floor? Just see them like that? Yeah. Okay, who do you believe it is? I don't know, tell me. Let's play that game. No, I'm not playing that game. That's not them on the floor. Okay, we took what? Actors? I'm gonna think of my kids as I choose to think of my kids. And you see them all? I just wanna go back to myself. Okay, but we took actors to do that? Is that what you think? We put them on your living room floor, same build, same hair, same face, and said, pretend you're dead? Is that what you're saying? I can't say anything. Yeah, you said, I don't believe that's them on the floor. You said that? I can't say anything. Did you look at those pictures? Didn't you recognize Sabrina and Amanda? Want to take another look? I don't want to see any pictures. Okay. Flat. But you're not serious when you say I don't believe there's them on the floor. I just want to go back to my side. Do you know what day it is today? Do you know what day it is today? I don't need to say anything. Do you know what day it is today? Yes. Tell me. I'm just going to go back to my What day it is today? What day is it? You don't know. I don't want to see any of that stuff. No, I'm not showing you anything. I'm just asking you, do you know what day we are today? Yes, I do know what day we are. Okay, tell I'm me. I'm not answering anything. Okay, because you don't know. Like I said, you can say, you can think what you want. I'm not going to answer anything. Today is the 1st of April. And you seem to think it's April Fool's Day. You believe what you want.
The suspect, for the most part, stuck by her lawyer's advice and refused to give any sort of admission to the alleged crimes. However, she still chose to engage at certain points, and her lack of reactive emotion during these moments was later used to argue both voluntary detachment and lack of remorse, as well as drive home the notion that her conduct was not due to mental illness, but by cause of her corrupt and calculated endeavor for revenge, which she was willing to attain by any means necessary. After nearly six years on the run, police tracked down Giuseppe DeVito in October of 2010. He had been living under an alias in St. Leonard, Montreal, and had considerably altered his appearance by shedding weight. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison, which he was made to serve at the maximum security Donnacona Institution. On the 8th of May, 2013, he testified at the murder trial of his wife, and expressed what appeared to be genuine remorse over not having been there for his family. Reports stated that he held himself fully responsible for the death of his daughters, and refused to give any damning testimony against his ex-wife. He was found dead in his cell just two months later. The coroner's report revealed toxic levels of cyanide in his blood and stomach, and his death was ruled a suicide. Adele Sorella was convicted on two counts of first-degree murder in July of 2013, but the conviction was overturned four years later, as it was ruled the trial judge had made errors when instructing the jury. Adele was released on bail for just over a year before her retrial commenced in February 2019. She was then found guilty on two counts of second-degree murder and rendered a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 10 years. Her earliest release date is March of 2029.